successful when you're subject to accelerate the change. I'm going to present it for an hour and understand here from the leaders of this conference that then we'll have time for questions and answers. And whatever is not going to be covered by questions and answers, there is a table there with material that you can go and study further or investigate further this methodology. <coughs> How to predict whether you're going to be successful? So let's see how to manage change to be successful. Let's start. If I tell you that there is change, obviously that's almost banal. Everybody talks about change, and I heard the previous speakers here. Everybody is talking about the accelerated change we are subject to. So that's nothing new. Would you agree with me that whenever there is change, there is going to be a problem? It's like walking down a road, and as long as there is no change, nothing is happening, until you come to an intersection, which is really change, and I have to decide to go left, right, back, stay in one place, you have to do something. However, each one of these new events, which we call a problem, really can be also an opportunity, and in the Chinese language, the word problem and opportunity is one and the same word. And we know that from personal life as well, that many opportunities you wish you never exploited them because they turn out to be enormous problems. And many problems, if you really deal with them well, if they don't kill you, they make you stronger. So they were really not a problem, they were really an opportunity. So whether it's a problem or an opportunity, it's up to you what you do with it. It in itself can be both. But I'm using only the word problem here in order to continue the lecture without confusing you. So anytime there is change, are going to be opportunities and problems. And the more change, the more opportunities and problems. So nothing new. Well, what's next? Well, if you have a problem, you have to deal with it. You have to decide what to do. You came to the intersection, you're going left, right, back. Some people say it's too complicated, I don't know what to do, I'm not going to do anything. Well, you just decided to stay in one place, which is a decision too. So anytime we have a problems, we need a solution. We have to deal with that or the solution will be imposed on us by not acting on it. If we do act on it, what's going to happen? It's going to cause more change. Now, so far, I assume I've not said anything new, really. I mean, just so, so what's new? But when I came to this conclusion, I kind of I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, oh my God. Look at the chart. If change is here to stay, and has been here for billions of years, please look at the chart. What is here to stay? Problems, right? I don't know about you, but sometimes I catch myself in the middle of the night asking myself, when is it going to be over? You know, enough is enough, you know? When is it going to be over? When are you not going to have problems? Only when there is no change, which means when you are Dead. Guys, having problems is not a problem. As a matter of fact, the higher is the rate of change your company is experiencing, the more problems you're going to have. So you are the cause of it. If you want to have less problems, I tell you what to do. It's like having milk on the stove and the heater is, you know, it's too heating. So just lower the heat, have less change. As a matter of fact, some people say, it's too much, I can't handle it, stop the world. They don't want to have problems, stop it. Well, <laughs> there is a catch here. If problems come from change, and you will have no problems when there is no change, which means you're dead, stopping problems means stopping change, which means what? Committing suicide, right? And that's what happened to the dinosaurs. There was a tremendous rate of change. They said they couldn't handle it, they disappeared. Maybe you can stop change of your company, but your industry will not stop. Maybe you can stop the industry, but the world will not change. Guys, we are in it. And the change is accelerating, and the problems are accelerating. But here are the good news. You can predict your problems tomorrow.
today of tomorrow. Problems are predictable. You can predict the intersection you're going to come to. I would like to give you a map so you can pre prepare yourself in advance to the problems that are going to come your way. Why are problems predictable? Because change is predictable. How is change predictable? Change follows always a life cycle. Everything I find out has a life cycle. People have life cycle. They're born, grow, age, and die. Trees have a life cycle. Guess what? Stones have a life cycle. If you're in the study of rocks, you'll say this rock is a very old rock. This is a new rock. Stars have life cycle. If you're an astronomer, you will say this is a very old star. This is a very new star. Guess what? Everything is a life cycle. The only difference is the span of the life cycle. A butterfly has a lifespan of a day. A star has a lifespan of millions, if not billions of years. And my goal in my professional life was to study what makes a difference. How to avoid for a company to be a butterfly. Some companies, many companies in the internet, born, grow, age, and die <laughs> within two, three years. How to have something which is a little bit longer, like the Catholic Church, thousands of years, still alive? What makes a difference? How to have a sustainable growth, which means how to predict success? Well, let's see. Why change produces problems? And what does it mean, life cycle? Because you see, if I have a life cycle I can predict the next problem. It will be like developmental psychology. If you study developmental psychology, you know, well, the kid is going through his typical twos, you know, and, you know, typical teenager, and then you have typical gerontological problems. There are predictable patterns once you have enough experience. And I was lucky working in 40 countries with quite a lot of companies. I started seeing patterns, that there is a pattern organizations have a life cycle. Not only stones, not only stars. Organizations too have a life cycle. And why do we have problems? I would like to make that point before I go to tell you what are the typical problems at every stage of the life cycle. And once you know where you're in the life cycle, you can predict your future problems. And if you can predict your future problems, you can prepare for them now so it doesn't become a surprise. It's like driving with a road map rather than driving in a foreign country without a map and every intersection turns out to be a crisis because you don't know where you are. Let's go back and find out why do we have problems when there is change and then we'll talk about what are the ch problems at every stage of the life cycle and then what to do about it, which is the purpose of this lecture altogether. Why do we have problems when there is change? Why? And there is a reason why. Everything is a system. Everything is a system. And by definition, a system is comprised of subsystems. When there is change, the subsystems do not change in synchronicity. They don't change together. Some change faster than others. That creates gaps. Those gaps are manifested in what we call problems. Let's take an example of a human being. Look at yourself. You're a system too. You're composed of multiple systems. There is you, your physical you. There is you, your mental you. There is you, your emotional you. And there is you, your emotion, the spiritual you. And they might not change together in synchronicity. You might be 40 years old physically, but maybe intellectually, you're much wiser than a 40-year-old person. And people say, wow, he's really 70 years old in his intellect. While you're 70 years old intellectually and 40 years physically, you might be still emotionally a teenager and your spouse tells you, when are you going to grow up? You know, it's time for you to grow up. And spiritually, maybe you're not born yet. That can create problems, doesn't it? Because you are not together. Now listen to the words together. I'm claiming that change is manifested by problems because change creates disintegration. 
Anytime there is change, the subsystems do not change together. There is disintegration, and the disintegration is manifested in what we call problems. And I'm telling you something which has taken on value. Please, I'm going to make a very strong statement now. Almost arrogant. I'm claiming that every problem, I don't care what problem, a problem with your car, with your plumbing, in your marriage, with your children, with your parents, in your business, physically, mentally, I don't care. I'm going to say that every problem comes from one thing, stems from one cause. Something is falling apart. If it's your car, something is falling apart. If it's your plumbing, something is falling apart. You have a problem in your company, something is falling apart. The diagnosis will be to find out what's falling apart. And you know what the treatment is? To put it together. That's why the word healing comes from the word to make it a whole. W-H-O-L, healing whole. And that's why a holy person is totally together. And in the Hebrew language, the name of God is one. And Shmo Echad. One. When you are one, you are together. And the whole purpose is how to keep it together. So it is a bottom line. Many of you are aspiring entrepreneurs or already entrepreneurs. The trick is not only to grow. Many companies grow. And you know what? As they're growing, they're falling apart. They're like the space syndrome. Expanding on the, on the outside, collapsing at the core. Either you collapse physically or your marriage collapses or your company collapses. The trick is how to make it grow and keep it together. How to make it grow and keep it together. Because as we are changing, as we are growing, Take a company example rather than a personal example. In a young company, marketing and sales change faster than accounting. And human resources is not even born yet. Don't even worry about it. That creates gaps. Eventually, the company has 30, 40 million dollars. The financial system, the cost controls, the, the cost accounting is in the stone age that they don't even know what's happening. In human resources development, they even never started thinking about it. That will event, the day of reckoning eventually will arrive because it's not growing together. Let me go over typical problems at every stage of the life cycle and just give you some insights and then the rest of it, as I said, you can find out resources to learn more. The first stage in the life cycle of organization is called courtship. And some of you are probably in the courtship stage. I'm looking at the age of the average group here. We are thinking to start something. We have an idea to start something. That's called courtship. We are not married yet. We are courting with the idea. What's typical, normal and abnormal at every stage of the life cycle? In the courtship stage of the life cycle, normal, a lot of excitement. And the founder, the entrepreneur, is telling everyone how great it's going to be, how great the idea is. Tell me. And there is a lot of noise, a lot of noise, excitement. Whom is he try trying to convince mostly, do you know? Himself, right? Why? And I'm going to shout the key word so you don't forget the next take on value. What he is trying to build by selling and saying how great it's going to be, trying to convince himself, what is, he what is he doing? Building commitment. Commitment. How strong is your marriage is how strong is your commitment. It's not when you sign the dotted line. How strong is your company? Well, how strong is the commitment of the people to the company? How strong is the country? In Russia, most people try to get out. Nobody could get out. Everybody could get in. In America, it's easy to get out. It's difficult to get in. Tell me which country is stronger. Are people trying to join your company? Are people trying to leave your company? I'll tell you which one is stronger. Commitment is the energy that keeps the organization alive and going. So what the founder is doing, building commitment, because the day is going to come when he's going to put the money, leave the job, start working, what's going to keep you alive is commitment. 
So what you want to check if you're a VC, some of you are VCs here, if somebody comes to you with a great idea, the technology, the market is there, don't listen so much to what they say. Because what they say is going to change very soon. Don't even listen to why they say it. Listen to who is saying it. Who is committed? Who is not going to sleep at night to rock this baby when it's born? Who is going to commit their life? Because starting a company, some of you are starting companies, is like the founder of Banco Nacional de Mexico said, starting a company is like going to sleep young and when you wake up, you're already old. It's one long dream and very often a nightmare. Are you willing to dedicate everything you have to make it happen? Depends on your commitment. So you have to check it. How big is the commitment? And what you have to check is that the commitment is, the risk is commensurate to the risk, to the commitment. Many people want to take tremendous risk with low commitment. It's called launching big ships in shallow waters. It does not work. So you ask yourself, who is going to do it? How committed are you? How much money are you going to pay to it? Is your wife behind it? Is your husband behind it? What do the kids think about it? What's your commitment? Tell me. Then I will tell you whether I want to deal with you at all. That's normal. Excitement, building commitment, drowsy dreams is normal. What's abnormal? That there is no reality testing. In the business world, it's called business plans. You know what a business plan is? Reality testing. What is the market? What is the supply? What is the people? What is the money? Reality testing. Which means really it's okay to dream as long as you wake up. It's important to wake up before you launch. Now that you have reality testing and you take the risk, the company is born, which is the next stage. The company is born when the risk is taken. And tell me the degree of risk you're taking and I will tell you what is born the size of the baby being born. And then, as I said before, the commitment has to be commensurate. Normal in an infant organization is, I'm just giving you tips because there's a hell of a lot more than that. <laughs> normal in infant organization is normal. Listen to this, normal. That you will have an autocratic, opinionated, hard-nosed, impossible founder does not listen in my way, no other way, and autocratic, centralistic, terrible. Why aren't you participate? Everybody says, why don't you delegate? Why don't you participative management, you know? What's wrong with you with this autocratic leadership? By the way, I found it all over the world. I always thought, you know, we should have participative management, open-mindedness, and whenever I find the founder, I find very autocratic, centralistic, hard-nosed, what's going on? Well, I got the insight what's going on watching the Disney Channel on television. <laughs> Do you ever realize that whenever any animal, when they have their youngs, they are very dangerous? The same thing with the founder. He's been dreaming about this company for a while. Now that the baby is born, and there is a lot of risk, boy, am I protective. <laughs> I don't want nobody touching this baby. I'm going to raise the baby. I'm going to protect the baby. And why don't you delegate? Because I have nobody to delegate to. You should hire better people than yourself. If they're better than you, they're not working for you at that time, my friend. It's you. That's why it's a nightmare. It is a one-man orchestra, as they say in Spanish. It's you. You have to do it. And why don't you delegate? Because you don't know what the hell you're doing yet. So how can you delegate? It's still in your head. It's still a trial and error. <laughs> and then just, you know, it's, it's one long beta test, you know? So how can I delegate? If you delegate prematurely, you're not delegating. You're abdicating. <laughs> you lose control. You don't know what the hell is going on anymore. It really is all you. So it's very normal, normal, hear me well, to have a very autocratic, centralistic, manager, leader at that time. But now notice the next thing, very interesting. What's normal at one stage of the life cycle becomes abnormal at the next stage of the life cycle, becomes, uh, what is it called, dangerous to your life. What is it called? Um, what? 
pathological at the next stage of the life cycle. Normal, abnormal, pathological. What does it mean? As the company changes, what do you need to do? You have to change too. Guys, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I really, I pride myself when people after my lecture come to me and say, Dr. Adizas, you don't didn't tell us anything we don't know. I don't consider that an offense. I consider that a flattery because I'm not teaching anything you don't know. Because that's what you do with parenting, don't you? You don't parent a baby as if it is adult. And God forbid you parent an adult as if it's a baby. You better change your parenting style as the baby is growing. Same thing is true for a company. So it's normal to be autocratic and centralistic in infancy. Eventually the company goes to the next stage. You better start changing your style or you're in trouble. What's the next stage? It's called go-go. When finally the company can get stabilized. Uh, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you what's abnormal for an infant. Normal autocratic management. Normal, your cash short. Normal. Why? Because you're growing. And if you're growing more than 35% a year, you, you definitely need a lot of resources from the outside because you need for working capital a lot of money. The, more, the faster you're growing, the faster you're getting dry. What's abnormal is you do not predict your cash flow needs. So many companies invest in bricks and mortar and they don't pay attention to working capital. So you didn't make it, the budgets are not based on cash flow, they're doing accrual and this is really for the IRS, but for you, you better do cash flows. And you watch out your cash flows as you're growing. Okay, normal in an infant organization is that you will have no job descriptions of any depth. A job description for an infant organization should be of one word, everything. <laughs> Whatever needs to be done, my friend. Why? Because in an infant organization, you want maximum flexibility. We are growing. It's like a baby. It's like you don't want to have it a baby in a black suit. Flexibility. Whatever needs to be done. Commitment is the most important word. Eventually, the infant organization will stabilize. What does it mean stabilize? Cash flow is positive. The suppliers are repetitive. The customers are repetitive. <sighs> We catch our breath. Now we are cash flow positive. As you catch your breath, it's like a baby. What happens to a baby when it starts sleeping all night long? Finally, we can start breathing. And what happens to the baby? It starts looking at its fingers, at its toes, outside, and they start crawling. And what do you have to do with the baby when they start crawling? You do not lose sight of them. Why? They open their drawers, everything goes into their mouth. They jump from the sofa first, right? Same thing with the company. That's called a go-go stage. The company stabilizes, positive cash flow, looks good. Now the founder feels untouchable. We did it. We made it. We are succeeding. We are growing. It's wonderful. The world is on sale. Everything is possible. Let me see what the limits are. And a go-go company starts expanding rapidly in too many directions. That's typical. You're in the shoe business, they start getting interested in electronics. What the hell are you doing in electronics? Well, what we did in shoes, we can do in electronics. And by the way, we are thinking about real estate. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they are all over the place. New markets, new possibilities, strategic alliances. It's growing rapidly in many directions and too rapidly, as a matter of fact. That's a go-go. Normal for a go-go. If you ask a Google company, show me your organization chart, they have a smile on their face and they say, which one do you want, last night or this morning? Because every night they change their chart on a napkin, you know, <laughs> it is very flexible. The organization chart looks like a piece of paper on which a chicken has walked all over it. Dotted lines, solid lines, and other lines. Who reports to whom? Well, it depends, whatever needs to be done. Somebody gets a job. Why did you get this assignment? I don't know. It caught me in the corridor, so I got the assignment. It is really flexible, rapidly growing, rapidly changing in many directions. In a go-go company, the headquarters are in multiple places in the city. It is scattered. Go-go company, norm, that's normal. What's abnormal is the centralistic, opinionated, hard-nosed, non-participative, 
leadership from infancy continues into Gogo. That is starting to be abnormal. Why? Because now this person does not listen to anybody anymore. That's called arrogancy. Now the founder becomes arrogant. We made it, we succeeded. Don't you tell me, you know, we cannot do it because if you were so smart, how come you were not smart before? I made it in spite of you guys, so you're not going to tell me. And they are not listening. And what's happening? They get to know less and less what's happening in the company. They expand more and more with the dreams in their head. And eventually, it is predictable, by the way. Listen to me. It's predictable. The Gogo company will fall into trouble. Eventually, this baby will fall off the sofa. Eventually, this baby will stick something in its mouth. He has no business sticking it to his mouth. As a matter of fact, the therapy for a Gogo company is to insist on an external board of directors. Insist. So somebody has to control this monster which is running in too many directions too, many, too fast. When a Google company eventually gets into trouble, and it will, it is only, a, it, trouble could be it gets sued by the franchisees, sued by the stockholders, it gets, it gets into trouble with the SEC because it, the, the, the stock was not issued correctly or they made some agreement incorrectly. And you can see, by the way, this, where you're in the life cycle does not depend on your size. You can have a billion dollars Google company. I have a client right now which is a five billion dollars Google company. It's not, the, it's not the size, it's not even a chronological age. It will depend on control and flexibility where you are in the life cycle. So, and you can see the newspaper, you open the newspaper, they're getting to, right now, many of these, WorldCom and Enron and all of these companies, they were go-go's which were not watching their systems and their control system, just space syndrome. When the Google company gets into trouble and they start losing cash or they're losing profitability and they will lose profitability because in a Google company the assumption is the more sales, the more profits. They just assume it automatically, the profit margins are fixed. So sales, sales, get us sales, new market, sales, 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 new product, sales, sales, sales. Eventually, you know what happens to the profit margin? Goes to hell <laughs> because they're not watching the supply chain. They're not watching the system. They're just assuming that the control is there. Eventually, obviously, it is not there and the profit margins shrink and they don't know what hit them. What happened? A Google company suffers usually from lack of accountability. Who really is accountable? Because you remember an infant that didn't have an organization chart? In a Google, it's changing all the time. So how does the information flow? Who is really responsible? As long as you're successful, everything is fine. And the founder is a genius. And the board of directors doesn't like, dare to challenge because you don't challenge a genius until the trouble occurs. Overnight, from being a genius, it becomes an unguided missile, a crazy man that we need to get rid of because the company is in trouble. He destroyed the company. He knows how to build the company. He doesn't know how to keep the company. Tremendous pain. That's the next stage in the life cycle called adolescence. In adolescence, what's happening? From Gogo -go to adolescence in political science, it's called from absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy. And sometimes the transition is not constitutional monarchy, it's called republic. They kill the king. Same thing happens in the Gogo -go it, as it moves to adolescence. Either they organize the company and put some law and order and systematize it. That's what's called governance. That's why it's all in the newspapers now with all these gogos. We need governance, we need structure, we need accountability, we need law and order. Or they get rid of the founders. That's called killing the monarchy. They just get, get killed out. They destroy the company. Well, when that happens, when you get rid of the founders, I call it premature aging. Because these are the people that gave it the strength, that gave it the energy, that gave it the vision, that gave it the direction. And now when you get rid of them, that's what happened to Apple Computer. They brought a professional manager to put some law in order, and what happened? The company whistled out. It's predictable. What you really want, you remember, is growing together. You don't want to get rid of the founder. What you want to do is institutionalize the leadership, the entrepreneurial spirit into the company so it's not personified like it is in Gogo. 
Because all the entrepreneurship is personified in one person. Now what you want to take is that entrepreneurship and make it as part of the company structure and processes so it is embedded in the company. That's why you're moving from individual monarchy to constitutional monarchy. The company needs constitution, the company needs structure, the company needs processes which are predictable and not that personified. Let me give you a dictum from the military. Organization should be structured by genius so that any idiot can run them rather than by an idiot, it takes a genius to run them. The transition from gogo to adolescence is extremely painful, extremely difficult. That's where the partners split, usually. If the company was built by partnership, when they hit the trouble of gogo, and they're losing money, or they have a problem with the product, or there's a big legal suit against them, the, the, the founders start fighting. And usually the, the, founder, the founders are usually a complementary team, and that's how it should be if you want to be successful from the beginning. Let me talk about it for a second. All of you that are married, watch something very interesting. You're married to somebody who is different, aren't you? You married somebody who is different. If you're an entrepreneurial, creative, uh, extroverted uh, person, you probably married somebody who pours cold water over your head and tells you to cool it, you know, enough. Which kind of a systematic and organized and thorough, you know? And if you are the thorough, systematic person, you probably fall in love with somebody who is very flamboyant and alive. What's going on here? Why are we marrying somebody who is different? Because for raising children, we need a complementary, complementary team. The children to, to grow healthy emotionally, they need both the feminine and the masculine energies. That's why if you're a single parent, you're going to say, let's say you're a woman, single parent, you say, oh, this kid needs a it's a man in the house. They need a man, you know, must, a mo man model. And if you're a man, a single parent, you say, oh, they need a mother. We need complementary team. Guess what? Building a company, you need a complementary team. It's like raising children. You cannot raise them alone. Hear me well. All of you entrepreneurs have a great technology, a great idea or something, innovation. You want to start a company. First thing, look for your complementary team. Don't do it alone. You can't do it alone. You need somebody who compliments you, who will put some cold water over your head when it's overheated. Because you will overheat. Necessarily so, because if you're not excited with your idea, how the hell are you going to start a company? You better be passionate. But you need somebody who's going to control this passion and watch out that you don't fall apart as you are doing it whether it's your spouse or your top secretary or a partner, you better have a complementary team. But that complementary team falls apart in adolescence. Why? We build a company and now we're having trouble, we're being sued, we're losing market share, you know, all the troubles of lack of form, because what you have is the interaction between form and function. Function has been growing, the form has been falling back, and now the disparity between form and function creates some crisis. And now what happens? The organized, the cool, the systematic partner starts feeling very, very angry with the entrepreneurial partner who did all of this and says, because of you, we lost the company, you're running too fast, you're not thinking through, you're, 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 you're a dreamer, you're not realistic, we are going to lose everything we built so hard because of you. And the entrepreneurial partner goes home and says, I made him a millionaire, and now what do I get for it? Look at this. Instead of him being supportive of me, he's now my enemy, this is not working, let's split. And usually, who buys whom out? The administrative type buys the entrepreneurial type out. Why? Because the entrepreneurial type says, I've had it, I don't want to deal with this bullshit, I have another idea, I'm with another company, I'm going to do it all over again, buy me out. <laughs> This is called premature aging. Why? Because we lost the oomph. We lost the oomph. The trick is how to grow 
together, how to grow together. And the way there is a lot of work how to do that, the lesson company move from entrepreneurial management to professional management. And there is a sequence to it, but I'm running out of time, so I'll let you read. The next stage in the life cycle is called prime. If the company succeeds to overcome the troubles of adolescents, where usually there is a love-hate relationship between the company and the founder, the company is in love with the founder, but also hate him at the same time. We need him, he's the future, he's, he built this company, but he's also the source of all our troubles. He's the source of all our crises. How do we control this? But we don't want to control, but we want to control. And the founder also has a life-hate relationship. I started with a little monkey, and it grew to be a 200-pound gorilla. Now, the, how the hell do I control this gorilla? How do I get freed from this? <laughs> I, I love it, but I hate it in the same time. I'm a prisoner of my own creation, and they don't know what to do about it. So adolescence is an extremely painful stage in the life cycle organization, and most companies do not know how to get out of it. The next stage, if you get out of it, is prime. The organization is systematized, structure, leadership. The difference between prime and gogo -go is both of them have a rate of growth, high rate of growth, but in, in, in gogo, -go, your opportunity driven in prime, your opportunity driving. You know what you want, you know how to get there, and you get there. It's controlled flexibility rather than flexibility without control. If you do not know how to stay in prime, you will start aging. So better be careful because some companies get to prime and get out of prime pretty fast. And in the notes we distributed to you, you have about 17 factors that show you what happens in the organization culture as the organization starts aging and it will not be reflected in the financial statement. Financial statement is a urine test. It is after the fact, you're already sick. By the time it shows in the financial statement, it's, it's, it's done. You want to catch it earlier, and you catch it in the psyche of the organization, in the cultural organization. There is a power shift that occurs in the company as the company starts aging. The next stage is called aristocracy, when everybody is very happy, everything is fine, we're making money, but nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Everybody is sitting, uh, enchanted with their past, they're paralyzed to deal with their future. There is not much change, you know, just, just don't, don't, don't fix it unless it's broken. This is a typical expression, but in the meantime, it's breaking, you know, so they're not proactive. And since they don't do anything about it, eventually the changes in the market will catch up with them. And eventually they will lose their advantage or whatever they have. And that, that, then the next stage is recrimination, when they start accusing each other, firing people, who did it, why we are losing it. Usually the strategic planner gets fired first, and the marketing, then the R&D guy next, and the company is dying very fast. And then bureaucracy and eventual death. Well, the rest of it is in the book. What's going on? Let me tell you what's going on. So I'll give you the bottom line, how to predict success. I found out, I found out that you can predict success with a very simple formula. Very simple formula. Any way you want to measure success, whether it is lying on the beach and surfing all day long, or collecting lint in your belly button, I don't care, or whether it's to make billions of dollars and be the richest man on earth, I don't care how you define success. Success is a function of a very, very simple variable. If you understand it, you understand a hell of a lot. It's a ratio between external and internal marketing. Let me explain what external marketing is. There are thousands of books written about external marketing, and this is the classical marketing theory. And if you take all the books on marketing and you summarize them, you will find out that basically what they deal with is how to match opportunities to capabilities. That's all that is to marketing. What are the changing opportunities out there in the marketplace? 
What are our capabilities? How do we match it? What product? How do we market it? How do we price it? How do we place it? How do we support it? It's basically how to match opportunities to capabilities. That's all that is to marketing. Internal marketing is how much blood, sweat, and tears are you going to put inside the company to convince people what to do and make things happen. This is called internal marketing. This is all the politics. All the time you spend convincing, begging, kicking ass, kissing ass, doing whatever it takes for things to happen. That's internal marketing. And after 30 years of working with many companies, I realized that it is a function of mutual trust and respect. Let me define the terms because it's not so simple. I have a whole book trying to define what it means. Not so simple. Respect I picked up from Immanuel Kant, the philosopher. He says respect is when you recognize the sovereignty of the other person to think differently. It's not whether you speak softly, you know. I've been a faculty at UCLA for 30 years. Whenever some colleague of mine will say, may I respectfully disagree with my learned colleague, you know, he's sticking a knife right into your heart. So it's nothing to do with respect, okay? It's not the style you speak. It's not the style, guys. Respect is when you realize you can learn from somebody who thinks differently. Can I learn from you? When all people, this is a Zen expression. If all people think alike, none of them is thinking too hard. If two people agree on everything, one of them is unnecessary. <laughs> you want to compliment yourself, you remember? Complimentary team? You want somebody who is different? So you learn from them? Respect is when you recognize the right, the sovereignty of the other person to think differently. Not you only allow them to think differently, no, let me show you something. This is a symbol of my methodology. This is a symbol. Please look at it. Do you see something very interesting? You have five different fingers working together. Five different fingers. Usually we say, I would like to build a team that all of them are like me. All you're going to have five fingers like this. You're not going to have a team, guys. Nobody wants to hire this finger. Look how difficult this finger is. Nobody wants this finger either. I mean. <laughs> We need five different fingers that work together. Work together. Please realize something. In all religions, I checked it. This is a curse. In Arabic, if you do something like this to his face, you're cursing them. And this is a hamsa. You know what it is? It's a blessing. The difference between a curse and a blessing is just two inches. If we are different and together, that's a blessing. If we are different and not together, that's a curse. Because we aren't learning from each other. We are not benefiting from our differences. We are not capitalizing on our differences. That's mutual respect. That's mutual respect. That's mutual disrespect. What's mutual trust? Is when you believe that we have common interest. When I'm not afraid to turn my back. I trust you. Why? Because if you stab me, you're stabbing yourself. We are in the same boat. We have common interests. Not in the short run, by the way. That's a dream. To have short, short, you know, this win-win climate that's created in a stable environment. You don't have a win-win climate ever in the short run. You can have only a win-win climate in the long run if you have a faith that it will work out. It will work out. It will wash. You must have that faith. You must have that belief that in the long run there is common interest. When there is common interest and a climate that you are willing to learn from people that are different than you are, then there is mutual trust and respect. When there is no mutual trust and respect, what happens? Internal marketing is very high. You're afraid to turn your back. Why is he saying it? What does he mean? What was he leading? What is he doing? Suspicion, politics. Oh, my God. Why does this formula predict success? Because we know from physics, and many of you are engineering students or faculty, that there is 
no perpetual mobile at any point in time energy is fixed and any point in time energy is fixed even the most productive human being is only 24 hours a day now what I found out is that that fixed energy predictably gets allocated it gets allocated first to internal marketing and only the surplus that's left goes to external marketing. Now, if I lost you, I'll show you some examples. Take a human being that went to the best business schools, got an MBA, all A's. His parents gave him an inheritance of $100 million cash in the bank. Good education, lots of money in the bank, and even, let's assume, very good looking, great presence. Is he going to be successful? Some of you might say, can I get his phone number, right? I mean, this guy has the money, the looks, the education. Great, right? What if I tell you that he has no self-respect and no self-trust? For whatever reasons, doesn't have it. You can go to school and get A's. That's, that's easy here, but here you don't have it. He has no self-respect, no self-trust. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know whether I'm doing the right things. I don't know what people think about me. I have no self-esteem. How successful is this going person going to be? Not very much. You know why? Because all the energy of this person are being wasted between his ears. His eyes are turned inwards. Who am I? What am I going to do? Am I doing the right things? The $100 million in the bank is like a Rolls Royce but you don't have the key to turn it on. Total waste. The good looks, he doesn't even know he's good looking. The education is not what the paper is written on because he cannot apply it. Until he goes to psychotherapy and they clean up his head and turn his eyes outward by building trust and all at once the energy gets free to deal with the world. They go to the next stage. You have a person who is like they call in yoga centered. I know I am, I know I am not and I'm at peace with myself. Do you hear the word? I'm at peace with myself. The moment you're at peace with yourself, all the energy is available. Now I can go and do something. But God forbid you have a disastrous marriage. No trust and no respect. One good fight in the morning, you cannot work at least until noontime. The energy is not available. Thus, when you hire somebody, take their spouse to dinner and check the relationship. You want somebody who is available, as a strong, supportive family. Otherwise, they're not available. Next stage. Now you have a person centered, knows who he is, who is not, self-respect, self-trust, available. Family, supportive family, available. But now marketing, fighting with sales, sales, fighting with production, accounting, fighting with everybody, when the, climate, when the client comes, what do we say? Come tomorrow. I'm exhausted today. Why are you spending all your time? Internally, you have no energy to pay attention to the external world. When are you going to pay attention to the external world? When there is a peace inside. Listen to me. Everybody talks about strategy. Success is not how much money you have. Money will always come to a good market opportunity. It's not technology either. If there is a market opportunity, you will find the money to develop the technology. So what is it? Management, time, and energy to find the money, to find the market to develop the technology. And what kills your time? Internal marketing. Strength is not from the outside inside. Strength is from the inside out. Pay attention as you're making your company grow that you don't destroy the inside of the company which is going to stop your growth and kill your growth. Success is not what you do, but what you are. It's easy to copy what you do. All this intellectual property pr pr protection, guys, it costs a lot of money to protect. You know what it protects you? How easy is to copy Starbucks? What they do is very easy to copy. Try to copy the, the, the culture. That's very difficult to copy. The biggest asset that a human being has, 
that a company has or that a country has is not what you have, but what you are. Thank you very much. When a company is at its um, stable or prime, like is there, can you keep it there? What will make you keep it there instead of going into um, aging? The way to stay in prime is, okay, you as a person cannot stay in prime. Your family can stay in prime. What does it mean? You better have children. A prime organization must spin off. It's very important to spin off. Okay? You spin off the colonies and you emancipate the colonies. And then when you look at the prime organization, it should have a portfolio of business groups or business activities or business products, like it has a portfolio of business of, of, of products. So you will see in a prime organization structure, when we structure them, you will see a unit which is aristocratic. That's your cash cow. You have an you have an organ unit which is in gogo. You have a unit which is in infancy. The cash cow is feeding the infant and the gogo. The gogo is reinvesting in itself. The, go the infant becomes a gogo. The gogo becomes a prime. The purpose of prime is to create new infants. And when it becomes aristocratic is to finance everybody. So basically a prime organization is an extended family. You yourself cannot remain in prime, but if you recreate new markets, new product, and restructure, remember what I'm going to say to you now, guys. I didn't say it before. The most important thing to maintain your growth correctly on the life cycle to remain in prime is to continuously restructure your company. Let's call also reinvent, but many people reinvent the company product-wise, technology-wise, market-wise, not the structure. Don't you dare to do that because a structure is like a pair of pants on a baby. You buy for a little kid a pair of pants. Within a year, it's underwear, right? I mean, you outgrew the pants. Organizations outgrow their structure. If you try to build an, a building, three floors, it's, real estate is very good. Add the fourth and the fifth and the sixth floor. It's going to collapse. What do you continuously have to redo? The foundations. So go, prime organization to restructure it and restructure it. Why? Because the babies are growing and new babies are being born. So an organization is like a power boat. Power boat, why? It has engines. You want to change direction, increase the engine on here, decrease the engine here, and the boat will turn around. You have to manage the power structure of the company. You constantly have to manage the power structure in the company. Are the powers correctly aligned in your company? That's how you continuously stay in prime. Is the structure, power structure in the company correct? You should never have a vice president for sales and marketing. Wrong structure. I don't like the CFO phenomena at all. I don't put treasury and control it together, no. The moment you put sales and marketing together, I have news for you. You don't have marketing in the company. Marketing is doing sales support activities, little brochures, little this and that. They're not doing marketing. And never put R&D and manufacturing together. You know what they're going to do? Maintenance. So the structure is to be right. And you constantly have to restructure. If you have not restructured your company in the last three years, I'm telling you now, you're already in trouble. Three years into the environment is too long. Too long. So that's how you keep in prime. 